Sand, is it a solid or a liquid to you? To answer that, let's do a quick experiment. This shaker is filled with sand and that one with water. Liquids flow and solids don't, right? This is just the first of many sand-related paradoxes that we'll discuss today in the Lutetium project. On Earth, many of our resources take the shape of small grains. Sand on beaches, grain in silos, sugar and salt in our kitchens, gravel on roads, and even tablets in pharmaceutical factories. All of these are examples of granular matter. Just like soap films, polymers, or liquid crystals, granular matter belongs to the field of soft matter. Because, often enough, it's not very clear whether it's a liquid or a solid. With our shakers, for instance, it's easy to get lost. Water doesn't flow, as if it were a solid, while sand does, just like a liquid would. In the case of water, this is due to surface tension. In order to flow, the water has to go from this situation to that one, resulting in an increase of its surface area. But surface tension tends to make liquids choose the shape with the smallest surface. As a result, if the holes of the shaker are narrow enough, surface tension can go against gravity and water gets blocked inside. Surface tension originates from interactions between molecules of liquids. These attractive interactions do not exist between grains, and therefore, sand has no surface tension and it can more or less flow. More or less, because in fact, it does not flow as well as a liquid, which we can see by looking at this antiquated contraption, an hourglass. If we look at it with a high-speed camera, we can see sand falling in small clusters. This is called an intermittent flow. It can be explained by another essential difference with liquids. Molecules in liquids are millions of times smaller than sand grains. While molecules are continually zooming around in all directions because of thermal agitation, sand grains are way too big to feel its effects. At rest, grains don't move at all. Grains also rub against each other, their movements are therefore blocked. These two aspects, stillness and friction, enable grains to form very stable structures. For instance, grains often organize into arches. This effect is called vaulting. Just above the neck of the hourglass, arches are continually forming and collapsing, breaking the steady flow of the grains through the hole. An arch is a bit like a pile of wooden planks. It is very sturdy in the direction of compression, but very fragile in any other direction. In order to see that even better, we can do another experiment. We take a stick, put it into a container, and fill it with sand. We tap the container to make the sand more closely packed. In the end, the stick is blocked. If we try to pull it out, we leave the whole container. But in fact, it only takes a little rotation to free the stick. What happened is that a lot of arches formed between the stick and the walls of the container. These arches are very resistant against vertical friction forces, but they are easily broken by torsion forces. But arches do not only stop the motion of grains, they also redirect forces inside of the granular material. It's even possible to see it directly using very special grains, namely small soft polyurethane discs. At rest, they're mostly dark when observed under polarized light, but under stress, they become bright. This phenomenon is called photoelasticity. When a grain is bright, it means it's under compression and that it's deforming elastically. Now, let's see how a force propagates in a pile of grains. To do that, we'll compress the grains uniformly from the side. We could expect all of them to go bright, starting from the ones on the edge. Well, that's not at all what happens. Only some grains become bright along complicated ramified paths. Compression forces are only transmitted along those paths, called force chains, that follow the arches. The grains outside the arches don't feel the compression force at all. The darkest grains could even be taken out without the whole structure collapsing. In fact, there are two kinds of force chains, a few long vertical chains and a lot of short transverse chains, and they're organized just like in a cathedral. The network of short force chains exactly balances the long force chains, just like arch buttresses and buttresses hold the weight of large gothic bolts. In both cases, these structures are very sturdy. Piles of grains can withstand huge forces without deforming, and cathedrals are still standing centuries after they were built. We've just seen the effect of force chains. Now, let's hear it. This time around, our grains will be glass beads, just like this one. If a single bead falls, it bounces really well. It makes a very sharp noise and bounces back quite high. It underwent an elastic shock. Almost all the velocity it had when falling down was recovered when going back up. Now, if we drop a cluster of beads tied together, it doesn't bounce at all, and it makes a loud thud. 
Here, it's an inelastic shock. Almost all of the energy was lost in the contact between grains when hitting the ground. The force chains inside the cluster redirected momentum in all directions. The upward force became too weak to create a rebound. All mechanical forces are therefore transmitted in a very peculiar way, and it is also true for weight. Weighing grains inside a silo is actually quite hard. Here are 2 kilograms of metal beads. We're gonna put them into a smaller version of a silo. At first, everything's fine. Weight grows linearly with the volume of grains. But the more beads we add, the slower the needle moves on the scale. After a while, it almost stops moving. It looks as if the beads had become much lighter. The force chains transmit weight downwards, but also to the sides. The grains exert a lateral pressure, as a liquid would, but they also rub against the walls of the silo, just like a solid would. The pile of grains is hung on the walls, just like a mountaineer spreading their arms and legs between two cliffs. Their weight is then exactly compensated by friction forces. Now to another sand-pushing experiment, and this time without walls, so that there cannot be any arching. Usually, when we push against the material, we expect it to contract along the pushing direction. Well, as usual, sand just can't be like everyone else. Let's take some compacted sand filled to the rim with water. If we push on it, the sand gets dry around our hand. If it gets dry, it means that some water got sucked in below our hand. And for that to be possible, grains had to meet some space for water to get into. The available space between grains has increased, meaning that sand is a material that expands in volume instead of shrinking when we push on it. This is known as dilatancy and it is yet another discovery of physicist Osborne Reynolds. At rest, grains are in stable positions. The voids between them are as small as they can be. When we push on them, the pile has to deform. But as the grains are all closely packed, they can't rearrange simply by slipping. They have to roll on one another. This state is not as compact as the initial one, creating more space for the water to get into, and the water level goes down. In the end, can we say that sand is a liquid? Not really, because we've seen it would be a liquid without any surface tension or thermal motion. Can we say that it's a solid then? Not quite either, as it doesn't transmit forces homogeneously and it dilates when we push on it. In fact, what makes sense so unusual is its heterogeneous nature. It's made of a complex arrangement of grains and voids interacting with each other. And we'll never understand the physics of sand without taking into account both grains and voids. It's somewhat similar to cooking. It's not very interesting to eat cooked cherries and cook those separately, no thanks. But on the other hand, a cherry clafouti. It's much more interesting. That's it. We hope you enjoyed this last video in our studio. There might be a few more released on our channel, so don't hesitate to subscribe. And if you have anything to say about the video or its content, just leave us a comment. And again, thanks for watching the Lutetium project. Mm -hmm.